So what is the moral foundations theory? Well, let's break down the name. It's a scientific theory that was developed about 10 years ago now by Jonathan Haidt, Craig Joseph, Jesse Graham, and they were building on the work of a cultural anthropologist named Richard Schwader, who was trying to find the human foundations of morality across cultures. These are the things that people think about in terms of right and wrong around the world. Moral foundations like these underlie our systems of morality and give them structure. They shape our values and ultimately our political beliefs. These foundations are intended to capture fundamental moral concerns, things like whether people are getting their fair share or doing their fair share of work, respecting legitimate authority or caring for sick and vulnerable people. There is also a darker side to each moral foundation, namely the manner in which it is violated. In this video, I want to briefly discuss each of the foundations in the moral foundations theory, as well as their basis in research, and I want to talk about how the moral foundations theory has been used to elucidate differences in people across the political spectrum. To better cover the foundations, I am going to ground them in examples from Season 1 of The Walking Dead video game, which is of course universally regarded by anyone with any taste as a masterpiece of fiction. I know I kind of delivered that like a joke, but it's not, it's not a joke, it's really, it's really good. Also, video games are art, so deal with that. There will be some minor, out-of-context spoilers. Fair warning. Let's start at the beginning. For the uninitiated... In the first Walking Dead game, you play as Lee Everett, a former history professor who is on the road heading out of Atlanta, Georgia at the onset of the zombie apocalypse. Near the start of the story, you meet an eight-year-old girl named Clementine Marsh. Who is this? I'm Clementine. This is my house. Hi, Clementine. I'm Lee. Who you take into your protection after she saves you from her zombified babysitter by being very timely with a hammer. Did you kill it? She quickly becomes the strongest trigger of your Care Harm Foundation which concerns basic empathy for others and a desire to care for vulnerable beings, especially young children and baby animals. <coughs> Clem is put in danger and discomfort on your watch constantly, and game statistics indicate that people jump at the opportunity to minimize her suffering. We're gonna try to take care of each other. Yes, deal. It's worth noting that the developers almost didn't put Clementine in the game because they weren't sure players would care enough about her to drive the plot. <laughs> I'm glad I have you. Me too. <laughs> this child, this was, the, they were worried you wouldn't care about <laughs> this child. Thank you. <laughs> My little sweet. Generally speaking, the cuter someone or something is, you know, small, big eyes, the more you'll feel this impulse when you need help. This foundation, like many others, is also linked to in-group, out-group associations. People tend to experience less direct empathy like this for those they perceive to be more unlike them, such that they aren't in the same tribe, so to speak. However, you can transcend those boundaries if you're Aww. cute enough, and Clementine occasionally uses her powers to generate empathy in reluctant allies. Hey! You're just gonna leave us here? Sorry, I must have missed that part of our conversation where you became my problem. Don't leave us here! Please! <sighs> Come on! Make it fast! Shortly after meeting Clementine, you happen upon other survivors and begin to work with them to find shelter, fend off zombies, and gather supplies. You're frequently faced with questions of proportionality, like who should have what and how much, as well as who should be doing how much work. 
These situations are the strongest trigger of the Fairness Cheating Foundation. They range from distributing food to figuring out what to do about supplies that have been stolen, up to and including what punishment is fair for those responsible. We can't let one person fuck this up for everyone else! The intuitive desire to be treated fairly relative to those around it? you is extremely deeply rooted. These capuchin monkeys are receiving different rewards for the same work. The monkey on the right is getting tasty grapes, whereas the monkey on the left is getting pieces of cucumber, a much less coveted food. Monkeys quickly get irritated with that sort of unfair treatment, and so do humans. Fuck you! Much of The Walking Dead revolves around survival and basic resource management. You can rapidly gain favor with a person by sacrificing for them and their loved ones, or even just showing an interest. How's your son doing? In an emergency situation, people are eager to cling to those they know they can trust in a pinch. You're damn right. Throughout the game, you encounter many triggers of the Loyalty Betrayal Foundation, as you forge, strengthen, damage, and end relationships with the other survivors. The things that affect these relationships at the start vary. Sometimes just having stuff in common can help form a bond. I grew up in Macon. Right here in the heart of Georgia. That's what I like to hear. Beyond that loyalty between individuals, there's also a massive element of group loyalty, wherein you are loyal to those within your group and distrusting of those outside of it. So who are you people? Our group's gonna wanna know. We don't know who these people are. They could be dangerous. Acts of mercy or kindness towards non-group members become suspect in the light of limited means and persistent danger. Your group often encounters cases of us versus them, wherein you're pressured to do morally ambiguous things, like taking supplies from what appears to be a recently vacated car. Bonding between members of a perceived in-group is mediated by many factors, all the way down to biology. For example, oxytocin is a hormone that plays a heavy role in social bonding. We experience more oxytocin release as a result of contact with members of our own perceived in-group than we do from people we perceive to be outside of it. Please take note of my language there, because group associations are ultimately a social construct that we can be conditioned both into and out of, for better or worse. We also experience less oxytocin release at least initially, when interacting with people who just don't look and act like us, which obviously has the potential to exacerbate problems like racism and xenophobia. However, in a zombie apocalypse, sexism, racism, homophobia, and the various other social plagues we have as a society are overshadowed by the plague turning people undead. <laughs> so your in-group in The Walking Dead is just your particular band of survivors, independent of all that noise. And people are expected to remain loyal to other group members, lest they prove they can't be trusted. We stick together and we'll be okay. Commonly, upon the formation of any sort of group, people with the skills and motivation necessary to get into positions of leadership will often find themselves there, both formally and informally. Don't boss people around. I'm sorry. Somebody needs to make executive decisions for the group, though. In The Walking Dead, the Authority Subversion Foundation is triggered by situations that establish demonstrate or destroy these social power dynamics. In a world not beset with zombies, this also includes our relationships with powerful entities like governments and corporations, as well as presumed authority figures like teachers and police officers. In the game, however, this is fairly limited to informal dynamics between individuals. Your character, Lee, is given many opportunities to either seize or shirk leadership, as well as encourage or subvert the leadership of others. They have different ideas about how we should run our group. If they don't find any common ground, this whole thing's gonna fall apart. 
Authority is a complex topic that I'll be covering in several future videos because it's the thing I personally research at the moment, so I'll keep this one brief for now. Leadership is sometimes assumed with little question or conflict. You stay here this time. Seriously. Okay. But usually there is some resistance, tension, and negotiation involved in hammering out social power hierarchies. You like to think you're the leader of this little group, but we can make our own goddamn decisions. Some people just don't like to be controlled, no matter how legitimate an authority may be. You can lay off. Don't tell me what to do. You kill geeks your way, I'll kill them mine. Damn. The Liberty Oppression Foundation concerns broad questions of freedom, such as how many and what sort of rules people will adhere to. Yeah, you're in charge of the food and the schedules, but you're not in charge of people's lives. This one is the newest and least researched of the moral foundations, but we do know that it is most important to people who identify as libertarians, often to the exclusion of other foundations. Finally, we reach the Purity Degradation Foundation. This is best triggered throughout the game by the gross, shambling corpses from which you are constantly running, as well as their ultimate cause. Because the disease turning people undead is so dangerous and otherwise offensive, people go to extraordinary lengths to try and avoid it or rid themselves of it, including threatening and imprisoning children who may have been bitten. Throughout the game, there is rampant speculation about how the disease works. Characters will even try to remove bitten body parts like limbs to keep the infection from spreading. You also face more real-world relevant examples, like determining whether food you found laying around is spoiled or safe to eat. This Purity Foundation is also called the Sanctity Foundation, and it can concern matters of spiritual purity as well as physical. Though this is seldom relevant in The Walking Dead, you do happen upon a woman in the first chapter who has holed herself up in an abandoned hotel and barricaded the door to her room. After ridding the surrounding area of zombies and freeing her, she reveals that she barricaded the door to keep herself in, not to keep the undead out. Just leave. Let's calm down. You could be fine. I won't be fine. My boyfriend was bitten. You get sick and you die, and, and you come back and you kill anything you can find! I don't want that. It's not Christian! So she isolated herself after she was bitten. Because sanctity or sacredness or spiritual purity extends into metaphysical and otherwise not measurable stuff, it can change a lot depending on culture and circumstances. In a horrible situation like a zombie apocalypse, the sacred can boil down to very basic things, like keeping you and yours alive and helping vulnerable others when you can, trying to find some moments of peace and joy, essentially anything you can do to preserve and maintain your humanity under pressures that have robbed many of theirs. Y'all thinking you're safe? Sitting there acting like things are the way they used to be. The dead don't kill their own. It's the living you gotta be afraid of. These foundations work together, like the sliders on an audio tuner, to form a moral profile. People and groups are variably committed to each individual foundation. Much like music has many elements, playing at different volumes. A profile can change a lot depending on its settings. A person's moral foundations profile can potentially tell you a lot about them, including where they likely fall on the political spectrum. As I mentioned before, people who value the Liberty Foundation to the exclusion of others are usually libertarians. This is perhaps the best way to explain why most people don't intuitively mesh well with this ideology and why it remains kind of niche around the world. If you go to the left side of the political spectrum, 
you're more likely to find people who value the Care and Fairness Foundations much more than the others. And if you move to the right, conservatives trend towards having a fairly equal valuation of all of the moral foundations, but they do value the Care and Fairness Foundations less than people on the left, and liberty less than libertarians. These findings have been replicated across cultures. Those differences in which moral foundations people value, they underlie the political and personality differences in people across the political spectrum. If you want the whole story about the moral foundations theory, please read The Righteous Mind by John Haidt. This is the book that first got me into moral psych, and if you find this kind of stuff interesting too, it is very worth your time. Though I know it is mostly wishful thinking on my part, uh, this thing I'm doing here, Moral Fiber, is intended to be a series, which means I would prefer that you watch these videos in order. If only so that you, dear viewer, can properly witness my hopefully graceful descent into madness. I mean, so that you can more readily build on the knowledge that I'm providing you with, or whatever. Just, just, just you got, you got, you got to, you, you got to listen to me. You got to do it. You got to. It's, it's getting ugly out there, man. We got, we got to, we got to, got to get our shit together. We got to do it. I'll eventually go into each moral foundation in detail in future videos, but for the moment, I hope that I have laid a very strong foundation for you. Oh, come on. That was okay. Hey, take it easy. Damn. Alright, we'll talk more about this later. Let's get to the moral of the story before the crowd starts. Oh, shit. The moral foundations theory breaks down morality into six different components. Care, fairness, authority, loyalty, purity, and liberty. How much you value each foundation influences your moral and political beliefs. The people you most disagree with will often have the best view of your blind spots, so try to be patient and keep an open mind. The moral foundations theory is just one way of looking at this stuff, but you can objectively learn a lot about morality by examining its component parts like this and comparing the moral profiles of different sorts of people. Having the proper language to describe deeply held beliefs is important, and if nothing else, I think this theory provides that. I've personally found it's been useful in dealing with people that I disagree with to learn about this research and keep it in mind as I'm interacting with them. I try to appreciate rather than resent having people around me who have different perspectives provided they aren't otherwise insufferable, because I can potentially learn from them, and they can spot problems and present solutions that I might not have considered. Measuring these abstract concepts is, of course, difficult, and uh, many people in the scientific community think this theory is a good place to start. It definitely serves to demonstrate that morality is not some amorphous, unknowable mystery. Like anything, it all starts somewhere. Little girl, little girl, don't lie to me. Tell me where did you sleep last night? In the pines, in the pines where the sun never shines will shiver